one of the smartest bankers on the planet, Kat Taylor. Welcome, Kat. <laughs> Thank you. Now, we, we've had you on before, but this is kind of really specific. We're talking about innovation and financial services, and that's what you're here at this particular conference for. Mm -hmm. Yes. What is happening in financial services? I mean, it, it seems like the entire world blew up in that field since 2008. Yes, it did. It, we blew up. The financial crisis was quite real. We uh, re-regulated the banks, um, not in a revolutionary way, in my view. So the banks still uh, kind of were behaving the way they normally would. Um, well, that's not, not good. Now, from, from the consumer standpoint, that's not good. No. Oh, I will say the bright light is that Dodd-Frank did introduce more consumer protection through the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau run very ably by Richard Cordray, and they have had, as that area has been significantly impacted by their principles and enforcements. So if you take, for instance, payday lending, which is very pernicious, there's nothing good about it, it is not good for anyone. Uh, people really seriously need emergency cash, access to credit, they need to get on the credit ladder, but payday is absolutely the wrong way to do it. Um, and the CFPB, along with the FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, who's one of our primary regulators, has been going after large payday companies and shutting them down, or at least forcing them to change practices, which is very helpful. It is sobering, though, that a lot of payday has migrated to offshore and online and is very hard to reach in terms of enforcement. And we're past the flexion point where uh, the majority of payday borrowing is in those locuses that are outside of our reach. Mm. So really, we have to combat payday through smart innovation, which is the subject of today. And, uh, and that's what <clears throat> I was <laughs> trying to make my remarks about, which is what parts of banking as we know it will have to stay the same, can't be disintermediated, in other words. And what is the enormous opportunity to disintermediate everything else to take advantage of the internet, the network effect, and smart technology platforms, including machine learning? Well, from, from my standpoint as a consumer, the only changes that I've seen in banking since 2008 to me is just that there's been more computerization and I, I do less and less. In fact, I write less than 10 checks a year. Right. But that's a, a technology innovation. I don't see any change in attitudes. Yeah. So. So fair point. So, um, and that's what we're we're trying to create a model that um, treats banking with the respect that it deserves, and more importantly, treats depositors with the respect that they deserve. So here's the way banking should work, in my view. Banking is the first form of crowdfunding. We all love crowdfunding. Mm -hmm. It's exciting that it's. Uh, intervening in so many sectors, crowdfunded debt, crowdfunded equity, uh, Indie, Indiegogo and Kickstarter, just because you want to see something happen, you can be a contributor to it. Well, if you think about depositors in a bank, that's what we are too. We take deposits from uh, our customers and it is our duty as a bank to lend them back out into the communities where those customers live and for constructive business and nonprofit activities and also to support our natural capital base. We got away from that in the sense that we, um, for decades now, banking has not really, in my view, respected that deep connection that needs to be there between the source of the deposits and what they want to see happen. So we take those deposits and then we do what the shareholders of the bank want to see happen, which is to maximize profit. Our model eschews that. It's not that we don't have to be financially sustainable. Our regulators are deadly serious about that. We get it that we need to be financially sustainable to keep doing what we want to do and to protect our depositors as well. But we are the fiduciaries of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation's insurance fund. That is what allows depositors to place up to $250,000 in any bank and know that they can get it back no matter what. The FDIC has to make sure that banks are acting in a way um, that uh, doesn't jeopardize the insurance by taking too much risk. The banks were taking too much risk up to the financial crisis, and that's what we saw was a crash. Um, and by the way, at the, on the eve of the financial crisis, financial services represented 25% of gross domestic product. 25% of the economy was financial services. Really? And remember, and I say this, I'm not trying to be uh, disrespectful of, of us as bankers, but we don't do anything. We just provide finance so others can do something. So 25%, if that's kind of a finance charge, that's too much. Yeah. The, <laughs> but anyway, um, 
the banks um, were also taking more risk, and that's what the re-regulation regulation through Dodd-Frank was trying to address. The bank should have a risk profile that is uh, consonant with the depositor's ability to be guaranteed up to $250,000 of deposit funding that they get back when they, whenever they want it. So that's our deep commitment, is to respect the FDIC insurance fund and the wishes of the depositors, which are surely to fund constructive activities that lead to healthy, resilient communities um, reliant upon a natural capital base that's whole and hearty and going to let us be on this planet forever. In the face of climate, you know, imminent climate disaster and income disparity like we've never seen before, clearly our, we, we as banks are not doing a good enough job of getting that deposit funding to solution sets for those problems. But as the head of a bank, you have to be a bit of an economist for sure, and maybe a lot of an economist. Um, income disparity is, is not good for banking, is it? I don't think so. I think we're destroying bank customers every decade that goes by. Payday does that, um, but also income disparity means increasingly large segments of the population really cannot participate in the financial system. They don't qualify for a checking account. They can't get access to credit. Um, they get uh, given financial services that are more expensive to use. Um, it, I, I agree with you. I think it's foolhardy to think that we can't that we can have a healthy economy without um, a, uh, financial inclusion and financial resiliency. And it has to do with you know wages, but also with financial practices. The people in power don't give up their power easily, right. and uh, bankers have had their system and have had it their way for an awful long time. You're yeah. talking about essentially revolutions in the approach to banking. I hope so. Um, we're going to be aided, aided and abetted by the technology entrepreneurial community that's doing that at a very rapid pace. Um, Dodd-Frank notwithstanding, there probably could have been a more revolutionary re-regulation of the banks. Um, it's maybe simpler too because I think Dodd-Frank is like 1,500 pages of law and 150,000 pages of rulemaking or some, something on that proportion. It's a massively complex legislative agenda. Um, thank goodness that we got some re-regulation, but it probably would have been better to do something simple like, and we had these four rules we were holding out for, maybe they were a complete fantasy, but um, don't let banks get too big, cap the size of a bank if you, get, if you approach it. In yes, other words, that, that was fantasy. That was fantasy. <laughs> but if you think about it, the getting too big creates system risk. So we can identify uh, what's not too big to create system risk and keep all the banks below that, make them have living wills so that they dismember before they exceed that. It's important to the fourth rule. So that's for, no, rule number one. Rule number two is put back in something like the Volcker rule, which prohibited banks from taking um, equity-style risk in uh, securities markets. Mm -hmm. Don't let them do that. Uh, have them all have a high capital buffer. We have a 10% tier one capital requirement in our mm -hmm. bank. Uh, we would like it to be lower. We, you know, it would be easier for us to be financially sustainable if, it's, if it were lower. But if you have a reasonably high capital buffer, there's just more resiliency for the economic cycles by, for each bank. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing is let them fail. Never bail out another bank again, ever, ever, ever. You don't need to. If they don't create systems risk, you don't need to. If they aren't taking as much risk, it won't happen as often. Uh, if they have a buffer, it won't happen, it happen as often. And if you don't bail them out, then that um, brings discipline to the shareholder population because they realize they could lose their equity investment if the, they allow the bank to act in too risky a way. Um, i got to ask you this. Not everybody may understand what you're talking about with capital buffer, me included. Yes, yeah, so, yeah. So uh, can you explain what you mean? Sure. So as we grow, we have to have 10% uh, of our balance sheet has to be equity capital. So that really means that we can collect $9 a deposit, roughly speaking, for every $1 of equity capital we have. At the height of the financial economy before the crash, there were some banks famously um, put out of business who had as much as 33 times leverage. We have 10 times leverage, 33 is really, so in other wow. words, $33 of deposits for every one of equity. It's called leverage and uh, it's a great way to amplify earnings. To um, You can earn more money with more leverage, but it does increase the risk that you're taking uh, because if you have losses, um, you don't have as much of an equity buffer to cover them. There are an awful lot of changes taking place in the United States uh, and probably globally from a banking mm -hmm. standpoint. Um, 
What do you think is going to be happening over the next five years? So this is my favorite topic in innovation regarding banking because um, you will recognize some of these names, and if you don't, check them out. But um, and they're not the only ones. But there are very entrepreneurial, tech-driven platform companies that are taking services that banks do in sort of a clumsy way and making them very efficient with very high customer service. So Simple is one example of a tech platform that allows you to interact with your bank, if your bank was using their platform, uh, to do transactions incredibly easy on your mobile device, through, through your laptop, however you want to, at a very low cost with a high degree of reliability and an excellent customer experience. There's uh, LendUp, which is a subprime consumer lender that is reaching out to consumers burdened with high cost debt using huge data sets that are, com that are not um, abusing the consumers, in other words, not violating fair lending or something, not, not uh, trolling their social media sites or anything like that, but just good data that's much more predictive of ability and willingness to repay than the sort of clumsy or credit scores that we use. Um, and they're using machine learning algorithms, so they're getting very good at underwriting, essentially. Uh, and they uh, lend up in particular is a standout because they are committed to creating bank customers, helping people access credit and climb the credit ladder. So they're giving, awarding points to their customers for every positive borrower behavior that they exhibit, calling to say they're going to be late on their payment, tweeting back to a, remi a reminder taking a financial literacy course, whatever, and as they accrue those points, they get ever better credit terms. Cheaper, lower interest rate, longer term, more money. And they gradually migrate them to the place where we as a bank can serve them. Um, there's also WAVE, which is disrupting remittances. That's the ability to transfer money to another country. Um, it's been very expensive to do that for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, they're making it instantaneous on your mobile device at pennies. It's just incredible. Bond Street and other small business lending platforms. You might have heard of Lending Club. So all of these things are improving our ability to understand risk, to deliver financial services, and to create a good customer experience and lower the customer's cost. But they depend ultimately to do that on a low cost source, a, low, a source of low cost funds. That's what banks have. The deposit funding that we have, our cost of funds is 38 basis points. Mm -hmm. That's 38 one hundredths of one percentage point. Um, uh, as opposed to, uh, say, debt that uh, the capital markets provide, which could be 15 or 18 percent debt cost or even a securitized offering like SoFi, which is a disruptor of student loan debt, um, did a public offering with a Standard & Poor's rating of single A at 3%. So you, if your choice is 18%, 3%, or 38 basis points, 38 basis points allows you to pass a lot of low cost funding down to the consumer, but you have to be compliant with bank standards. We mm -hmm. could not let them access that deposit funding if they weren't meeting fair lending requirements, anti-money laundering, data security, consumer privacy, all those things. So LendUp spent 12 to 18 months getting organized in a way that they could assure our regulators that they're meeting all those standards. Mm -hmm. And then that's a beautiful um, relationship right there because uh, in a very safe and sound way, we can use our depositors' funding to fund loans that are literally rehabilitating the credit worthiness and credit access of consumers so that they can be much more resilient from an economic standpoint, much uh, more robust participators in the financial service sector, and have a lot more um, independence themselves and uh, just they get better products. Hmm. How many states uh, are is a program like LendUp uh, and others like it available yeah. in right now? Um, I, don't, I don't know about the others, but Lenda's probably a good example. They're um, the one by one getting uh, approved in states, and I think that they are now eligible to provide the funding in 18 states. They are regulated as a money service business, so they're regulated by the same uh, uh, California Department of Business Oversight that we're regulated by. Um, and that's really important that they meet you know, all those standards. But uh, I think this kind of, uh, to take um, Wave, for instance, which is a remittance company, right now they're just doing U.S. Uh, Tanzania. Uh, but when they get 
the infrastructure right in one country to country interface, it's relatively easy for them to go to the next country, the next country, the next country. Can your bank make money off of that too? Uh, yes, we do, and we need to make a little bit of money for mm -hmm. it to be financially sustainable so that we can scale it. Um, uh, and that was an important part of our participation. I mean, otherwise, if we don't make a little bit of money on the products we offer, we can't keep offering them. Mm -hmm. uh, and we also have a responsibility to our depositors to be modestly yeah. profitable so we have resilience. Last question, I promise. Mm. Is uh, being the, the president of an innovative bank fun? Yes, I, I think I have, with all uh, gratitude to my colleagues who literally run the trains on time every day, run a great bank, try to improve all the time, do all the hard work, I am sort of the external facing CEO of the bank and uh, I love my job for two reasons. Uh, one is that we're very excited about this model. Uh, I get to evangelize about it and that's not just a one-way street, that's not us just saying this is the right model, let's go. We get feedback all the time. The model improves through an open source conversation. So that is extremely fun and uh, exciting. And then uh, banking, you know, for all that I said, we don't actually do anything. We know a little bit about a lot of things because we work with every kind of company and nonprofit you can imagine. And in order to uh, do a good job of meeting their needs and meeting our underwriting requirements, we have to understand their businesses and their nonprofit models. So uh, we get to learn a huge amount about all sectors of the economy and all sorts of constructive things that people are trying to get done. Kat Taylor, thank you for being here. Sure, thank you very much. Rainmaker believes we can change the world.